Okay, good afternoon. Lovely to see you this afternoon. Thank you. Um, if you'd like to use the uh, chat bar to introduce yourself. And uh, there is also the poll coming up in a moment. Okay, so you can see on the screen there that there is a poll for you to uh, fill in. I'm asking you now what languages, uh, what language and at which key stage do you teach? So thank you for filling that in. And uh, do uh, introduce yourself in the uh, chat bar and uh, we'll start in a minute or so's time on the topic of modern language knowledge organisers. See that we have uh, people from London, from Brazil, from rugby, you're very welcome. Abu Dhabi from Kent, from Bournemouth in the UK, from Cheshire and Luton. You're very, very welcome. We'll wait another minute to uh, bring in the results of this poll. What language, what languages, and at which key stage do you teach? Are they from Bedford, Essex, Bristol, Kent, and Belfast? Welcome from Wiltshire, from Croydon as well. Wonderful to have you with us uh, from Abu Dhabi. Welcome. Brighton, sunny Scotland. Wonderful. <laughs> Venezuela connecting in from Essex. Wonderful. And from North Halifax. Very, very welcome. Okay, it's nice to see that um, around 80% of you have participated in this first poll. So shortly I'll share the results. And this will give us a basis on which to uh, start this webinar on modern foreign language knowledge organisers. On the screen, you can see there um, four colleagues have uh, given their endorsement for knowledge organisers in the language classroom as they've employed them. And uh, this is their feedback. Hello from Essex, London, very, very welcome from Leeds. Thank you for introducing yourself in the chat bar from Wickham in the UK, from Kent again. Hola. Wonderful to see you all. Yeah, we'll just give it a few more seconds and then we will share the uh, results of the poll and we'll crack on. From the Bahamas, you're very welcome. And from Leeds, lovely to see you. Okay, wonderful. So around about the 80% uh, mark of the participants who have uh, contributed to the poll, I'll leave it another 10 seconds. There's uh, around another 20 people that have not yet uh, participated in the poll. Hello from Hong Kong, lovely to have you with us. Good, and just to let you know that um, you can use the chat throughout the next uh, 45 minutes. And um, if you have any specific questions that you would like me to answer, please do not use the chat, but use the other um, information box, the question and answer box. And I will then open up the question and answer box at the end of the formal part of the presentation, and I will take your questions. Okay, we're close to 100 uh, participants. I'm now going to close the poll and show you the results. Interestingly, to see where we all are at, at what stage we are teaching. So as you can see there, we've got a, a nice percentage of people teaching a variety of languages. 57% uh, teaching uh, Key Stage 3 French, wonderful. Uh, we've got 51% of people teaching uh, Key Stage 4 French. German is there as well with 16% of you. And uh, we've got 43% who are teaching at Key Stage 5 languages. Uh, wonderful to see our primary colleagues here as well. 16% of you teaching at primary French, German or Spanish. Lovely. And uh, we've got 9% that are teaching uh, two or more languages um, at Key Stage 3. Wonderful. So we have a nice mix in, in, the, uh, in the audience today. So I've just closed that poll there. 
and uh, let's start the uh, formal part of the presentation. So here, um, if you if you will, this is the on the screen the the race course, the journey that we're going to go on in the next uh, half an hour or so. We're going to be looking at the definition of uh, modern foreign language knowledge organisers. Uh, we're going to be looking at the logistics of them and. We're going to be leaving a sizable amount of time at the end to look at the practice and what this looks like in our classrooms. Um, so if you have not found the uh, Facebook group yet, um, simply type into Facebook Modern Foreign Language Knowledge Organisers and you will join the um, 8,000 odd members uh, worldwide that are involved in the conversation. And um, you can find me on uh, Twitter at Mr underscore Klosh and uh, I've got another Facebook uh, page there that I've got open. And uh, there on the bottom there, you've got a little snippet from my CV in terms of my background. OK, let's move on then and let's start with the definition of knowledge organisers. And I understand that I'm, I'm, I'm going over some basics here. A lot of you will already know this. Um, but just to uh, put this out there, um, knowledge organisers have been around, of course, for years and years and years. But particularly, they've been made famous um, at uh, certain schools that have uh, prized knowledge in, in their strap lines. Knowledge is power. And uh, Kirby here has, um, in 2015, coined uh, a definition here of knowledge organisers. Um, of course, knowledge organisers come in all different shapes and sizes, from parallel texts to sentence builders, which are probably two of the most uh, used ones, but of course booklets and speaking and writing maps, in actual fact, anything that organises the vocabulary that we teach in the language classroom could be considered a knowledge organiser. But of course the methodology has uh, stepped up um, in recent years. So let's look at uh, the, the use of knowledge organisers then. Why would we use them? Well, first of all, um, I would suggest that knowledge organisers increase the learning return on the time and effort and the resources that we invest. I would suggest that if we are using knowledge organisers in the best way possible, students are doing 80% of the work and teachers are doing 20% of the work in the classroom. Because of the teachers, we as professionals, we have already made the decisions for what goes into our curriculum and what we want the outcomes of our students to be. And the rest of the work is the students actually engaging with the knowledge organisers. Second reason for the advantages of knowledge organisers, they reduce cognitive load. Uh, this, is, this is in all the cognitive theory uh, for education. Um, you can read a lot of books on this. I'll suggest a few titles in a moment. And of course, chunking is seen as a much more manageable way of learning language. Um, the idea that we can learn a phrase for example, in first year French, we may, may learn je m'appelle to introduce ourselves, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we understand how uh, reflexive verbs work. Or it may well mean that um, in German, we may learn a phrase like um, um, es freut mich, but it doesn't necessarily mean that when we are saying it's nice to meet you, that we understand how to use direct object pronouns. It's just we have that phrase. So the language is idiomatic and reduces our cognitive, um, our cognitive load in terms of understanding the nitty gritty of the grammar. And knowledge organisers can present this in simple forms to our learners. Worked examples. Once we have a, a, a text in front of the students that we have already uh, developed, then of course the students have an example to go back to. And of course we do this with vocab lists and the text. Um, uh, in a word list, but of course, why not offer students a paragraph of text or a whole essay, if we were, at uh, Key Stage 5, in order that um, students can see um, that authentic and that uh, in-depth use of uh, language. A fourth reason might be that, of course, with a knowledge organiser, we can break content down into chunks. And I would also say automatic chunks. I mean, there's no reason why in um, uh, so French, for example, students couldn't learn the phrase um, quoi que je dise, quoi que je fasse, whatever I say, whatever I do. Yes, it's high level because it's using subjunctive, but these could be automatic chunks and easy recall for students to communicate their message. Uh, why, why do we use them? Number five, because of course uh, we can tailor um, our knowledge organisers to the students' needs and to our context. 
we are the the uh, driver of the of the car as it were and we're not relying necessarily always on textbooks that don't know our students contexts and hobbies and motivations space learning is of course a great uh, advantage of using knowledge organizers we can always go back to previous knowledge uh, from the last lesson last week last term last year um, we are in control of the order and the speed at which we teach our students. Retrieval practice is another advantage of using this methodology, and uh, I'll give you lots of examples of that in a moment. And there's a debate often, um, you know, in terms of low stakes quizzing uh, as opposed to high stakes tests. You know, we're not on a weekly basis giving our students exams to give them grades. No, we're just simply checking to see if they have put some of this knowledge into their long term memory. And so low stakes quizzing is going to be something which uh, forms a good bedrock of this practice. So a little bit of theory. I don't want to spend too long on this. I did a lot of work on the theory last year at last year's language show, and you can find that video online. But just to uh, make it absolutely certain, the, the, the reason and the impetus for wanting to organise knowledge in language classrooms in such a way which speeds up students' learning is because there are lots of distractions in, in the environment. And our job, of course, as practitioners is to make sure that um, our learners put knowledge into their long term memory, as you can see on that diagram there. And this can be uh, read about in uh, Daniel T. Willingham's uh, book, Why Don't Students Like School? But this is laid out perfectly. Okay. We can also uh, read about the uh, forgetting curve in the book, Make It Stick. And this simply uh, reminds us that if we do not focus on um, the knowledge, for example, if we were to give students a list of uh, 15 words or a verb, uh, paradigm or some sentences that we'd like them to learn for next lesson well if they do nothing with that knowledge until next lesson then they will forget it but the more they repeat that knowledge throughout the week and come back to uh, tricking their brain if you were to remember that knowledge the more likelihood it will go into their long-term memory after all that's what we want from our students we want them to come back to each lesson having retained what we have taught them in the past and uh, John, uh, Dr. John Dunlosky, you can find his video on Facebook, uh, excuse me, on YouTube. And uh, he has a video that talks about the study test, test, test method before that final test in the sense of we have the final exam. And that doesn't mean that we should not be quizzing and testing students before that final exam, um, because in actual fact, as often as we quiz students on the knowledge we want them to retain, the more likely is that they will retain it. Uh, please see that uh, video on YouTube. And of course, it goes without saying that our working memory um, is limited. And of course, if our working memory is limited, that means that um, there's only a certain number of things that our students can hold in, in their minds before they forget it. However, were we to chunk our knowledge together, for example, rather than teaching um, students um, streams and streams of verbs, why don't students learn sentences with those verbs in? And it's more likely that they ha will have those in phrases ready to use, and it's more at their fingertips. Okay, I'd like to um, bring in another poll now, if I can. And the question is, um, if you use knowledge organizers, in which form are they? So I've just put that poll on the screen there now just to get a, an idea from uh, participants where, where you are at with your knowledge organizer usage. Okay, I'll let that run for another 20 seconds and then I'll share the results. Okay, I'm going to end the poll there now. We've got 87% uh, of people that have uh, commented and are now sharing the results here. Okay, thank you for that. You can see that 66% uh, of you use sentence builders, which is very, very interesting. In terms of uh, mind maps, 13%, parallel text, 16%. 
and uh, nine percent of you uh, don't think that you use knowledge organizers yet uh, which is very useful information okay um, i'd like to um, introduce you to um, different kinds of uh, knowledge organizers this is a parallel text and the way that um, we in our school use parallel texts is uh, we write them ourselves in advance and we use what is known as profs and pies. So you can see there that on the left-hand side is the target language, I, in this context, year eight French. And on the right-hand side, you have uh, the English. The top part on the English there is the, uh, is the standard English. And then of course, in brackets, you have the dodgy English. Why are there two versions? Well, last year, we only put the dodgy English into our text, but we realised that students struggled uh, with working out exactly what the English was. So now we've added the standard English into um, our parallel texts, as you can see there. And um, cross and pies, let's give you some examples here. So we make sure that we put past tense in all of our uh, parallel texts. Those who don't speak French, you can see the English on the right hand side for uh, what this is here. So we've got reasons there in our uh, parallel text there, um, we've got certain opinions, and we've got a subjunctive there on line 16. And of course, there's phrases as well that we've used here, and um, expressions. Now, this is one section of a 25 line parallel text. And the idea of using profs and pies is that from the first year, um, whether you're in key stage two or you're in um, key stage three or four, starting a language, that you start to bring in elements of high level structures straight away. So that you're not waiting until year 11, for example, to introduce a subjunctive in French, or you're not waiting until um, year 11 to introduce idioms in Spanish or in German, but you're introducing them from year one and students are becoming um, used to these and they can start putting them into their long-term memory. Of course, long term memory takes months and years to uh, automatize uh, language. And so that is the benefit of our five year courses that we're running or our seven year courses, however long students are learning French, German, Spanish, Mandarin, Italian, Portuguese, so on and so forth. Um, there's another example of a saying there. So that's a that's a parallel text uh, knowledge organizer that we use in our school. Um, here's another example in German, year nine German, you've got the English on the right there, and uh, that's just the dodgy English, I've not showed you an updated one with the standard English there, but again, you've got your past tense there, and um, you've got your reasons, you've got uh, opinions there, straight in, um, phrases, idioms, and expressions there. So, uh, as you can see, it's really important to make sure that we're, we're jam packing our knowledge organizers with the best knowledge that has ever been uh, taught that we're giving um, students the opportunity to have authentic uh, language and phrases that are used by teenagers in uh, in many of our uh, target language countries there so it's very very mixed and this is a year nine parallel text that we teach in um, september october of year nine so our students in year nine have uh, been learning this parallel text and adapting it to um, their own personalized versions using past tense straight away from um, the beginning of the year. Okay, um, I'm just gonna stop there and check to see if there are any questions that have come up and I'll answer those on the, on the hoof. So first question here from Gary says, how do you introduce the substitution vocabulary that diverges from the core parallel text? Great question, thank you for that, uh, Gary. I'll be coming on to that shortly, and I'd rather do that with uh, visuals rather than just speak um, without the visuals in front of me. Another question from uh, Gary here is, how do you answer the criticism uh, that this approach is too teacher-led? I'll answer that question straight away. Um, is this um, approach teacher-led? In one sense, the approach is teacher-led um, because of the methodology and all of the knowledge organizers that are written by the teachers. Um, teacher led in the sense that the teacher is the model for pronunciation. I don't think uh, that is an issue in the language uh, classroom. Uh, too much teacher led, perhaps you're referring to the fact that um, there's not enough, I don't know, group work or pair work in the classrooms. I'm not sure where your, um, your criticism comes from. And maybe you'd like to add a little bit more into the uh, chat bar, into the question and answer. Um, I'll play you a few clips from um, our classrooms at our school and you'll get the idea and sense that um, students are certainly not 
um, passive in the classrooms. They're not sitting ducks, just listening and um, having to retain everything they hear. It's a very much dynamic space to be learning. And I'll give you an example of that in a moment. Gary's got a second question here. How do you implement grammar? I'm thinking, especially in light of the IGTC, which has a grammar question at the end of the written paper. Thank you for that. I'm less aware of the um, IGCSE, but it's a very, very good point. Um, yeah, in some ways, um, these parallel texts and knowledge organisers and I work with don't put grammar at the forefront in the sense of today we're going to learn the present perfect. Um, you know, today we're going to look at prepositions, and that's never um, a phrase that comes out of my mouth. It's always from the point of view of let's look at this parallel text, and it may well be. That the parallel text is introduced like a letter that we have hypothetically received from um, uh, our German correspondent, a German speaking correspondent in Switzerland. And so we're going to read this and we're going to go into detail. Um, there are grammar uh, points um, laid out in our parallel texts. And we do use um, exercises to uh, drill all of the grammar. But a lot of the time we use um, replacement, substitute vocabulary. Um, and I'll give you some examples of that in a moment that drills the grammar in the lesson. Um, thank you, Gary, for your questions. Um, Cecile has asked, um, how long would you normally spend on a module if your parallel text is 18 to 20 sentences long? That's a really, really good question. Um, I'll give you some um, practical answers and visuals in a moment. But generally speaking, um, our parallel texts are 25 lines of language long. And the 25 lines of language are divided into four sections. So four questions, if you will. And each question has, uh, you know, five to six lines of answer. So how long would we spend on one section? We'd probably spend on five lines, two weeks, which is four lessons at our school. So four lessons on five lines. And I'll break that down into how we teach at our school in a moment. In terms of a module, a module of your PowerPoint, of, of the parallel text, um, I think you're probably referring to the way that it's built up with uh, textbook modules. Um, we loosely follow um, a scheme of work from textbooks, uh, but we break that, but we break away from that um, by adding our own language. Loic, thank you for your question. How do you embed the use of knowledge organisers in the lesson? I'll move on to that um, shortly when we look at the practice part of this. Um, Elizabeth, what would you say to those who think that using knowledge organisers in the classroom is not useful as students just copy sentences? My answer to that is, if students are not copying anything from the model, how will they learn anything? We want students to copy. After all, if you're sitting in a science lesson or a, a geography lesson, you're going to be copying the knowledge the teacher teaches you. You're going to have to um, apply that knowledge, but before you can apply the knowledge, you need to learn it in the first place. Is it not the same with languages where we want students to learn, for example, how to conjugate a verb? Of course, we want students to learn the vocabulary, how to spell it, how to pronounce it and how to manipulate it. But before students can manipulate anything, of course, they must learn it in the first place. And I would um, argue that the students have uh, a lot more power and uh, they have a lot more um, opportunity to put all of this uh, foreign language into practice in their personal um, context only once they have learnt it in the first place. So I think copying sentences is extremely important. But as I move on in this uh, presentation, you'll realise that um, what they produce is not copied answers. Thank you, Elizabeth, for your question. And I'm going to take this last question before we move on from Andrea, which is, how do you make sure the students identify single words if they learn them as part of a chunk? Great question. I'll show you in a moment. Sometimes students might know the chunk, but struggle to identify single words such as prepositions or specific verbs. Absolutely. And it is important, I agree with you, Andrea, that students know the different elements um, that make up the chunk of language. After all, within a chunk, there's going to be verbs, prepositions, nouns, and um, students, of course, need to manipulate um, the, the chunks as well. So we'll, I'll be showing you that in a moment. Thank you for your questions. That gives me a great idea on how to move on and uh, give you some information in order to answer those questions. So we're now looking at the section logistics and deciding on the most important content. 
I'm going to run through this quickly because I want to move on the practical side. So here on the screen is um, what we in the department have drawn up as to what we want to be the most salient parts of our curriculum, the universals, as you will, what we want all the students to know in each year group. Um, I'm not going to um, spend time on this too long, but we've worked on this and divided it into um, year group. And here we go. This is the second slide with that on there. You can see the idioms that we want students to learn. You can see the tenses that we want students to learn. Um, here are um, the student versions of that, the universals. So all of our students have this stuck in the inside um, front cover of their books. And by the end of each year group, by July, they must know at least one to five of each of these um, sections. One to five differentiated. If they're high achieving students, one to 10 of each section. This is for year seven. So yes, we do teach them high level stuff. OK, let me break that down and compare year seven French with our first year German students. So we do exactly the same in both languages, more or less, as you can see there. And you'll notice that um, we've introduced, introduced um, three tenses there straight away in year one. Um, now I'd like to compare the three years. So each universal page the students get is um, increased in it's graduated in, it's increasing in complexity so if we compare these sections in each of these year groups for french so as you have for year seven you've got very basic j'aime je n'aime pas je déteste je préfère whereas in year eight we've added j'ai une passion pour ça m'ennuie de j'ai horreur de already you can see the complexity moving on to year nine we then add ce que j'aime c'est so you can see how we're building on the blocks from previous um, years uh, in order to strengthen their complexity and their uh, variety of language. Um, Giving you some more examples here. These are our top 10 verbs that we use. So in year seven, um, all students are expected to know top 10 être, or certainly one to five at least. So that they can say, je suis, je suis pas, il est, nous sommes, j'étais. They need to know that by July of year seven. Top students will know être for um, all of that uh, verb power down there, all the tenses. Same in German, for sein. We don't teach any other languages at our school. Excuse me for the limited examples here. And you can see there that you've got the GCSE versions there um, in French and German of uh, common verbs. So we drill these uh, verbs throughout the year so that by the end of um, year 11, the students use all of these phrases in their exams. From year 10, we're teaching all tenses um, in this format for each verb. And we, uh, we use Memorize. This is how we drill it with them. Great uh, online uh, learning platform. OK, um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to skip to the uh, practical side now. So as I uh, run through this very, very quickly, um, this is um, an example of our substitute vocabulary on the right hand side. So the students will have um, the parallel text, which is on the left there, and they'll also have a vocab list. This acts as their dictionary in one sense. They can use these words to replace the words in bold on their parallel text to personalize their text. There's uh, some more sections there coming up on the screen of the kind of things they have on their substitute vocab list in the booklet. OK, I'm going to skip this poll and just move on to the practical side of how to use these in the classroom. OK, so here is the basic format that um, we would follow. So we would teach um, language, we would consolidate it in the next lesson, we would check it in lesson number three, and in lesson number four, we would apply that knowledge. Um, we would uh, give two homeworks in between the teaching stage and the consolidation and check stage in order that students can go home and learn what they have um, been presented in the class. Uh, we call this learning self-quizzing. Let's break this down even further. What does the teaching look like? Lesson in, lesson out. Well, there's an idea of how we would do it in our school. Um, we would, of course, model and uh, the language chunks in context. We do a lot of listening, comprehending and repetition. We're doing a lot of reading, listening and repeating. The teacher as model, choral repetition. We'll do a thing called um, elbows and ears, which is where students, once they have um, practiced um, with the class, 
a phrase or a list of words. They would then put their elbows on the table, their fingers in their ears, uh, fingers in the ears because they will block out everyone else in the classroom and they would read the text in front of them or read the vocabulary list just to practice. Fingers in the ears, try it because you can only hear your voice internally and it's a great way of having 32 students in the classroom doing um, pronunciation practice at the same time. Lesson two, we will consolidate it. So um, this is following the homework. So we would recall last lesson's uh, language. We would do more call repetition, cold calling, uh, listening translation. Uh, we'd probably use some mini whiteboards to do some dictation. And then we would self and peer, peer quiz. So lots and lots of repetition the whole time with games, left, right, centre. Following another homework, which is when they get to go and practice that work again. Um, they come to the lesson and uh, we have our weekly knowledge quiz. So this is the second week for us because we have two lessons per week. Um, and then following that, we then start to adapt that um, language that they've learnt. We model new language chunks um, from the substitute list. And then we start to apply it in the fourth lesson. We embed the language, we do lots of narrow reading tasks, listening tasks, narrow pronunciation tasks. And that final box on the bottom right gives you an idea of what our quizzes look like. We give them a score out of 10, lots of uh, merit marks, congratulations, and lots of um, praise for all of their hard work. So a very, very positive atmosphere. Um, here's an example of a um, straight line way of doing this. So we're using mini whiteboards to drill all of the universals. They go home, they do their self-quizzing. So there's an example of a homework there. Um, following the self-quizzing, we might give them a translation um, task. This is a year nine example, slightly high level. Um, we then would do some pronunciation in context of the parallel text. We would then personalize it using the substitution language. So using lots of mini whiteboards, pronunciation games, and they'd go home and they would learn their personalized version using self-quizzing, more about that in a moment. And uh, then we'll do a quiz the next lesson and we'll consolidate it even more before they have their final assessment or quiz and their test. Um, in order, and these are the practical things that we do. In order to help with pronunciation, we um, annotate the text. You may have heard of cuddles or deer, made famous by the Michaela School. Um, this is uh, useful for French and German. It would probably work for Spanish as well, dotting silent letters and underlining the vowel combinations and the R's, exaggerating the accents and highlighting parts of the uh, knowledge organizers that have high intonation. What does that look like? Here we are, these are some of our uh, booklets. I use uh, a visualizer in the classroom. So this is my work, students copy, and we do lots of pronunciation games, have lots of fun uh, doing tongue twisters in the classroom, looking at how we can improve our pronunciation word by word, chunk by chunk. And we do the same with our um, substitute vocabulary. So we're really hammering pronunciation, looking at the spellings, double letters, where the R's are, what are the silent letters? We put the dots underneath the silent letters as we say these words out loud. Okay, um, so what do we do when we're practicing, when we're having fun? We do things like, I say, you say, listen and repeat. We do, I say, you translate. We might do, I say, you translate into English. So these are the commands that the teacher is using and the students are very fast paced throwing this back at the teacher. He says, we say. So a student has a model or he says, and we translate. Listening practice for everyone in the class. I say you change. What do I mean by that? I mean, it might be that we have the phrase, j'aime lire la poésie. And I then shout out the word writing and everyone shouts out, j'aime écrire la poésie. I then shout out listening. Everyone says, j'aime écouter la poésie. So we're, we're translating that word. I may shout out as a teacher singing, j'aime chanter la poésie. So lots and lots of fun drilling, fast paced games like this to manipulate language. Do the same with uh, nouns. There's an example there. You could do that with opinions. J'aime lire la poésie. I hate. Je déteste lire la poésie. The students are shouting back the French at me. Just going to skip that slide there. I've spoken about elbows and ears. 
I want to move on to uh, giving you an example of the self-quizzing homework. So here you can say it's a look, cover, right, check. Um, we've got the uh, parallel text at the top there, and this is an example of a student's exercise book for homework. They write the English. I watch sometimes the cartoons, dodgy English. They write the French. Je regarde quelques fois les dessins animés. They've had their first attempt. They've covered it up. Look, cover, right, check. They got it wrong. They've ticked and marked it. They have to do it again as homework. We do it again as homework. Second attempt, they still didn't get it right. They cover it up, they check it, they're getting it more right and right. And then eventually their homework looks like this, that they hand in for that one line. So this is the self-quizzing of knowledge organisers. And this is what their homework looks like. They are doing their self-marking. I, as a teacher, do not mark their homework. I check under the visualizer for the odd students to see if they've uh, ticked mistakes, so on and so forth, and then I correct them and teach them how to self-quiz again. Practical point number three. Uh, number four um, is, again, it's about substitution of vocabulary. So having them write their own phrases, and then we go onto the website, natural readers, they type in their new phrase, they listen and repeat at home. So their pronunciation, they can do work on this at home in all these languages that are available here. OK, um, I'm just going to run on to um, this one, which is an example of a piece of work my students have produced this week. You can see the parallel text on the left and you can see their work on the right, personalised. Uh, this is following about nine weeks of, of work on par this parallel text. And you can see the standard of work, the French speakers amongst you, of what they are producing. Uh, there's another example there. So, you know, we're looking at some very, very high level work here that students are producing from memory on what they like watching on TV and what, what they like reading. I think you'd, uh, as a year eight student, I think you might uh, consider this is something uh, which some of our GCSE students, uh, not having learned under this method, um, are able to produce. Okay, I'm just gonna skip on and give you now a recording of uh, one of my year eight lessons. Uh, please have a listen. I watch. Je regarde. Je regarde. Oh, that seems to have stopped. Let's just do that again. My apologies. Often. The documentaries. I often watch documentaries. Like, for example, comme par exemple, le planet in French. Okay, that just gives you a little bit of a taste test, so I can show okay. the parallel text one. Hello, my friend. My name's Jasmine. How are you? How are you? Me, I'm well, thanks. How old are you? Me? I'm 11 years old. I'm 12 years old. J'ai 12 ans. When's your birthday? My birthday is on the 1st of August. And Wednesday, Tuesday, Tuesday, Mardi, I say you say Mardi, Monday, Lundi, I say you say Landy, Thursday, Très bien. Okay, let's stop there. Um, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of what the lesson sounds like. And um, just to let you know, they had no visuals in front of them whatsoever. So that was some of the drilling of the parallel text um, there, um, manipulated. Okay, um, I'm just going to finish off with uh, giving a shout out to these colleagues online. I've produced some wonderful work on the uh, parallel text, um, sorry, on knowledge organisers. Um, so if you go to the Facebook page, you can find a lot of these examples um, in the file section, give you some more information. 
And um, in the next uh, last five minutes, I'm just going to now try to answer some of your questions that have come up in the chat here. Do feel free to add more questions. OK, so I'm just uh, reading now. Um, Gary has come back with um, how often do you quiz them on these as opposed to quizzing them on the parallel text? So I think you're probably referring to the substitute vocabulary, um, Gary. Um, how often do I um, drill them on the individual words? Um, I would say that the parallel text is something that we um, drill every week. And then as part of the parallel text quizzing, I drop in some of the substitute vocabulary um, in the quiz as well. So there's a mixture of both. Um, I hope that answers that question for you there. I mean, it's useful to obviously mix it up and also bring in some old vocabulary from the previous uh, month, the previous year as well, to keep recycling um, and making sure that we um, are spacing out their learning as much as possible. Okay. Um, I've got a question here from Aurélie. What if we don't have Facebook for the resources? Are they somewhere else? Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of um, the resources which are also shared on the MFL Twitterati on Twitter. Um, I've shared some, although limited, um, uh, resources of mine on the TES, the UK uh, website for teaching, uh, the Teaching Educational Supplement, the TES. Um, if you send me an email, I'm very happy um, to give you a few snippets of some of the things that you've seen on the uh, presentation today. I'm just looking to see if there are um, any other questions that I've not answered. Um, uh, Philip has asked, how do you ensure the knowledge organizers approach meets the requirements of the national curriculum? So let's face it, I mean, the national curriculum wants um, our students to uh, be um, able to manipulate their language um, in all four of the skills. Um, the national curriculum is, uh, you know, in some ways it's it's a lot more flexible these days. We don't necessarily have to teach this topic um, in year seven or that topic in year um, year five. Um, the government has left it up to us to decide how we approach. Um, the only thing that we need to be aware of is that we are preparing our students for the GCSE and A-level exams with the vocabulary which the exam boards have prescribed. In that sense, I think um, you know the, the national curriculum is left open to us. So I think there's a lot of flexibility there. Uh, Claudie, do you use knowledge organizers or sentence builders for Key Stage 5? Yeah, absolutely. Um, personally, I don't have the need to use sentence builders for Key Stage 5. Knowledge organizers for Key Stage 5, I would tend to use um, vocabulary lists um, and some chunking of sentences in order to um, teach the students at Key Stage 5 statistics and culture of the target language countries in the um, society, you know, the, the, the topics which we are teaching. But I, I feel the students um, have a good grasp of um, how to revise at Key 5. You may find that diff different. Okay. Um, question from Isabel, do you not teach a particular tense formally? Yes, there are times that we hammer um, a tense, but that tense is never new to the students because the students have already seen that in the parallel texts. So they will just remember, oh, I remember last year when we learned, for example, ich bin ins Kino gegangen, in German, and then they remember that, ah, that's how you form it, the gegangen, I remember that from last time when I learned it as a chunk. Um, how do you check the progress of slower students with the fast paced quizzes or even the pronunciation? Yeah, good point. So one way to do that is to cold call. So um, we do a lot of games where um, we do a lot of pronunciation games where if the students get it right, uh, they stand up. If they get it wrong, they sit down. And if they're sitting down and they still have a chance to play. So we do a lot of um, differentiation and um, boys shout out, girls shout out. If you're on the back row, shout out. If your birthday is January to March, you shout it out. So just, I mean, the teacher is very, it's very crucial that the teacher, of course, listens to check. OK, um, lovely. And there's one question here is how do you incorporate into conversation types of dialogues? Um, I'm not sure that I quite understand that uh, question there, Shua Zian. Um, do you mean that um, how do we make sure that um, this language then becomes part of a conversation? Well, the knowledge organizer parallel texts that we use are designed with question and answers. So that would always uh, lead itself, lend itself to uh, dialogues. And there's one question here from Almut. How do you check that the self-quizzing is done honestly rather than the students simply copying out the sentences? Excellent question. The answer to that is 
the quiz, the next lesson. If they're not able to write anything from memory, then they've not done the self quizzing correctly. And in that case, support is needed. Students can come back um, in their own time, or of course you may spend half a lesson reteaching how to self quiz. Um, it is a question of honesty, you're right. Okay, um, it's now four o'clock, so I'm going to finish this session. Um, thank you for your time. Um, I'd like to encourage you to come onto the Facebook group and onto uh, Twitter to continue this uh, conversation. Um, I'm going to uh, leave my contact details on the screen uh, for you to, uh, just as a reminder, but do come and find me on Facebook and on uh, Twitter. Um, there we are. It's uh, underscore cloche or MFL Knowledge Organisers. Have a very good weekend, everyone.